Hi there, and welcome to the second episode of the Astartes Anonymous podcast, where I've trapped myself in a room with three Keter class entities that will do their best to unravel the mysteries of Warhammer 40k that no one thought to ask and, possibly, end my life. Today we'll be discussing the silly obscure lore that we love. I'm your host Tom, and these are my co-hosts. Hello, my name is Lucas, or better known as Moots. Hello, I'm still red, and I am still tired. And I am Aaron, the oversized nurgling. So... For our news segment today, we've got a few things that we wanted to talk about. Uh, some things a little bit more interesting than last week, something a little bit less interesting. But to begin with, I think we have to talk about Dante. Honestly, pretty disappointed with uh, this uh, pose, or this model in its entirety. Oh. It's uh, it's so mediocre. It, it kind of like makes me sad, honestly. Like, the way he's posed against a rock mm. makes it hard to tell if he's like coming or going. And it just doesn't catch that in the moment look that I think it really needs or needed. It's like the golden, what was it called? The golden angle just barely exists here. Like I, I don't. I guess it's up to personal opinion, but I just don't think there's any like really good looking angle here. So I, I can see what they've tried to do with him, where it's like re reliving the sort of older version model of him. It's very classic style armor, the legs especially, the axe, the pistol. The, the the jump pack from what we've seen is a bit more sort of Primaris esque, like the Inceptors. But um, I kind of agree with Moot. It's just sort of a bit sad. He's tall, so he stands out on a board, but like it's just not much different or much special, like with Azriel, for instance, where they did it really well. Like it being an updated model, that's cool because the old Dante model is what I don't know how many years old. But what what sticks out to me is that. Dante's supposed to be the Lord Commander of half the Imperium in in universe now. Yeah. But his model doesn't reflect that to me. I mean, his model just makes him look like a fancy blood angel. Mm. And, uh, like, his profile. Like, if you just have the silhouette of his, uh, of his, of his model itself, it, it just looks like a normal marine, honestly. There's nothing that really denotes him as being this big figure in the Warhammer lore to me. Like, I, I want them to, like, maybe add some embellishment, like, give him, like, jump pack wings or something, or make his axe a bit fancier. Yeah. And, and it, it really is just they took the old model and they stretched it out a little bit, and, and that's about it. Yeah, I mean, I would disagree with that take if it wasn't for the Sanguinary Guard. Uh, I think someone, mm. someone else said to me a few days ago that he literally just looks like a sanguinary guard and is outside of the outside of the face he doesn't really sort of stand out at all uh, actually no even with the face he doesn't really stand out so it's i don't know i feel like with a lot of these primarisified models some of them are good most of them are good most of them are really good like azrael azrael was was really good some of them are good uh but i think the ones that are bad i mean this is, they, they all try to give some kind of ode to the old models that they come from to a certain degree, and I feel like, at least in my opinion, this one gives way too much of an ode to where it comes from, where I feel like this that sort of evolution hasn't hit this model, and instead what we've got is a true scaled version of the old model, uh, and, and, and that's sort of about it. I mean, again, I, I, I gotta say though, I do like the... I do like the Primaris Jump Pack. I think the Primaris Jump Pack is nice, but I think for this guy, I mean, I know a lot of people didn't like Shrike's Jump Pack, um, but it, at least they went to the effort of giving Shrike a jump pack that was unique. I feel like, you know, I, I feel I feel like Dante should have should have had that as well. I mean, he's got his little, these little wing sigils on it and the Blood Angels thing, but that's not enough. That's not enough. On the same note as like giving homage to older models, I I don't think it's necessarily a good thing to try and give homage to the older models because if you look at someone like Helbrecht's new model. Like, I just think that's so much more impressive than his his old one, because his old one was just kind of him yeah. standing there, walking forward, but his new one, he's like on this big scenic base with a dead orc at, at his feet, <laughs> servitors attending to him, and his armor's just like so chunky and big, he just looks imposing, like he, he has a presence on the tabletop that I don't think Dante is going to have. He's just on a rock. It's, <laughs> it's, it's so minimalistic in the worst way possible. And, I don't know, I, I, I just posted an image here in the Discord of, uh, what's his name? 
0808 DS, uh, like quick photo bash edit, and mm. I mean, it's not yeah. a perfect fix or anything, but I think this is at least way better than what we have right now. Uh, like just that slight angle upwards with the axe, uh, a bit of more uh, tilt on Dante. It just suddenly he just looks so much more in the action than. Uh... I mean, I don't know if you noticed it as well, but he did the open mouth. Oh no, I didn't. That's great. And even that, it's an it's another subtle thing that take that sort of separates him a little bit from. So it doesn't even separate him from the old model because the old model had an open mouth and the new one's just kind of got gritted teeth. But it makes him that much more dynamic because you know they're going to do Primaris Sanguinary Guard. And we know that as soon as that happens, the sort of uniqueness that is Dante is going to go right out the window with the sole exception of this little rock. You know, I mean, yeah, sure, we've got the little shout out to the... Um, oh, what's the... Death, uh, the company. Death, death Company, thank you, yeah. But why is it a death company, not something like a Chaos Marine's uh, head? Yeah. Like, that's something that's all over Chaos bases. They just have dead Primaris everywhere, but none of the real loyalists have any any, um, any dead Chaos people besides Gilliman, and that's about yeah. it. That's the only one I can think of. Here's another idea. Why not make it a Tyranid? Why not have Tyranids on his base? Oh, yeah. That does seem like the obvious pick to me as well, to be fair. Why isn't it a Tyranid? I think, obviously, we're saying to regard the armor and jet jetpacks and stuff which will sort of unify a bit. But I think the sort of masks are meant to be the same as the old ones, sort of thing, because death masks are just death masks. There's not really different versions of them. For sort of Blood Angels, they're very sacred sort of things. So they're meant to be very similar and yeah. in line with each other, because that's the yeah. whole point. Yeah, no, asking for asking for new masks might be asking, you know, a bit too much. I, I will say something I do like, though. I do like the Inferno pistol. Uh, it's mm. it's just lots of subtle details on it do create a very unique Inferno pistol. And there's not, there's not many Inferno pistols, uh, Infernal pistol bits for kit bashing floating around. You are very limited. And I certainly would say that this is the the, the nicest Imper Inferno pistol we've seen so far. And the only Primaris mm. Inferno pistol. Although trying to um, sort off that hand would be a total bitch. Yes. Right. Uh, let's move on. All right. Tonight on the Depticon, Tom marries the Tyranids, Moots dies of cancer, and I try to wake the lion up. So the lion has woken up. Do I have to talk about this fucking listen, listen to me carefully, Swamp Lord bit? Of course. It's, it's required. It's in your contract. So at Red's request, I've had to put this on the screen. Because he really likes this meme. Listen to me carefully, Swarm Lord. You will marry my brother Rubuti, and that will be the end of it. <laughs> We're moving on. So what do we think? First thoughts. I like it. I like Old Lion. I like him a lot, yeah. I think they've done a really good job. They've made him very sort of different, but sort of still similar to his heresy model. So it's like a big difference between 30k and 40k. I love the fact he gets two watches in the dark. That being uh, milk and yes. cigarettes. Um... Milk and cigarettes. Dad's back from the store, boys, and he's brought home the milk and cigarettes. <laughs> Love the swords. Love the fact he has the Emperor's shield. I think that's a really cool difference with Gilliman with the sword and him with the shield. It's obviously a very sort of left-hand, right-hand deal. I think that's sick. So, with the return of the Primarchs, are we just going to start seeing them hawk the Emperor's like various trinkets at him. Hopefully. Gilman has his sword. <laughs> I guess the lion gets his shield. That's quite funny because obviously Rogel Dawn's missing a hand and the Emperor has a power yeah. claw. Oh shit. Yeah. That would be sick. Corvus has the cock plate. It'll, it'll, yeah, I was just gonna say it's gonna be funny when they, he starts running out of uh, items and it's like <laughs> yeah, uh, Jagatai gets the Emperor's toothbrush or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> Least favorite son at the Christmas giving. <laughs> oh yeah, I guess the Emperor sucks. <laughs> uh, no, but I, I really, really like this model. Uh, all the different head options are just absolutely splendid. They and are. Great. I, I really dig the hooded one, the helmed hooded one. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I saw this the, um, the other day, and I thought it was fucking hilarious. <laughs> For fuck's sake, what is this? Aaron. <laughs> yeah, Aaron had to put that into the... <laughs> into the <swamp. laughs> 
<laughs> heresy, heresy, <laughs> accurate lion model right there, man. <laughs> That's beautiful. Thank you, Aaron. <laughs> What's more interesting than all of that is that the lion is physically aged from his heresy yes, self. Yes, he, he has. Because yeah. he was not in stasis like the, uh, like the Gilliman was. But it shows that Primarchs do have a lifespan, or at least they, they age physically. Mm. They do get older. You could say... You could say he's aged like fine wine. <laughs> he has. He has. I wasn't initially sure about the old f the the old age face when this this thing here, like this 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 straight on picture, was all we had. But when I started seeing it from other angles, I realized it really suits him, and I really like it. He looks it. so pissed. He looks like one of those old guys that you'd never be able to beat the fuck out of you. It's just like I'm not. I'm not messing with that where, guy. Where are his eyebrows? <laughs> Gone. Where are his eyebrows? Uh, you paint them on red. You paint them on. Cypher Cy shaved them off in his sleep. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're in the Blood Ravens reliquaries where they are. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so his weapon, his sword, is called Fealty. Uh, he doesn't have his usual sword. Cypher still has that. So we'll have some fun <laughs> narrative. We'll have some fun narrative uh, bits to unpack I when he eventually... I forgot he took the sword. Yes, and he doesn't get it back. He gets a new power sword called Fealty. I don't know where this sword comes from, or if this has already been established in what, the lore. What but... happened to his chainsword? It got, it got broken when he fought Conrad, I think. But uh, 50 bucks uh, saying within the first week of him being released, someone puts uh, the Emperor's sword on him. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Oh, yeah. I bet someone, someone at GWHQ has already done it. Oh, probably. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> That'd be cool. The only thing I don't like about this mini is his backpack, and as far as I understand, that's like generally what people. Yeah, I like about it. This. It's not even the backpack; it's just the wings. I bit. like it. It's um, it just sort of obviously links the sort of dark angels, angels part to him in a sort of not necessarily subtle but very sort of symbolic way, and I think it really reinforces the sort of Arthurian knight style aesthetic that dark angels have going on. So I think it vibes well. People just don't like the way they've done it. Yeah, but Arthurian knights didn't have wings on their backs. Yeah, it's just iconography, though. It's just there wasn't a really an angel. A there wasn't really an angel aesthetic f with the Arthurian legends. Sorry, something I've just noticed for the first time, and this this picture I got on the screen now is he has, or I believe, is some sort of special plasma pistol. Yeah, he's I, a dark angel. I think yeah. that's his original plasma pistol. Is that his original pistol? It looks like the same one on his Forge World model. Oh, okay. Oh, that's cool. Well, at least Cypher didn't make off with that as well. <laughs> you got some swanky pictures on them, though. I forget what the first sure. one does. Milk, milk or cigarettes was guarding it, I think. Milk or cigarettes, I think, yeah. <laughs> which no, one, but... Hold up, hold up. Sorry, right. just to just confirm. Which one's milk and which one's cigarettes? Cigarettes is the one holding the long pole, and uh, milk is the little one. Yeah, this is what I was thinking as well. Milk is the one with the sheath. Okay, gotcha. I feel so sorry that... M Milk's job must be very stressful. Every time the lion wants to sheave his sword, he's just like, please don't stab me, please don't stab me. Yeah, he's just like holding, like trying to aim the sword at the sheath. Like, no! <laughs> the, the, li the lion model reveal kind of standard me a bit, because there was a rumor going around for a while that it shouldn't be like, very robe heavy, it shouldn't look quite sort of uh, majestic. And I was going to turn him into like a 40k non chaos corrupted Corvus, because I thought that'd be quite sick. But. Um... Uh... Well, he is very robe heavy, but it's it's leaning into yeah. the knight aesthetic too yeah, much exactly. for that. So it's just not going to happen for me, sadly. I prefer it. I like how his armor is pretty flat and um, just plain compared to Gilliman. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's more. I mean, I was about to say it's more practical. He is. He has got wings on it and <laughs> lion stuff, but it is. It's not. It's ornate, but it is nowhere near as ornate as Gilliman's. They really. They really went mm. went hard I love with Gilliman's. I love the shoulder pads on this guy. A lot, yeah. Some people don't like him. I really like him. I think they're very very aesthetic for him. Yeah, I'm 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 also also a huge fan of the shoulder pads. I think they look cool. I think um, this shoulder pad. Someone's going to correct me, but I think this shoulder pad here, the one on his shield arm, is the same shoulder pad from his original armor. I'm going to get told I'm wrong about that. I wouldn't but I doubt think it, it is. And I wouldn't doubt that at all. Well, no, he's very cool. I like him. Uh, I have to ask, what do we say? So we, we're told he's got the Emperor's shield. Now, no one's ever seen any pictures of the Emperor with a shield, but we've all seen him with a tilt shield, and it does kind of look like his tilt shield. I was shield. saying, wouldn't it be funny if the Emperor was just that big, and we didn't realize he was that big? That would be so goofy. But have you seen the art for the, 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 the cover art for the Death and the End, the book? 
yeah, of the, the Empress sat atop the Golden Throne. Yeah, but well, like Malkador only... standing right next to him, and by the size comparison, Malkador is huge by the figures walking up to the stairs. To be fair, oh, yeah, I suppose maybe. it kind of falls in line with the whole Magnus theory. Magnus is just using his psychic powers to make himself huge. The Emperor could very easily do the same. Yeah, well, I mean, we know that he can do that, but I don't know. I, I get the feeling that it's not his tilt shield because that would it's too be mental, kind of isn't goofy. it? <laughs> yeah, although it is a very, very funny. Fault. Yeah. No, it's cool. It's cool. He's gonna have some funny in-game rules. He's just gonna be a mega blade guard veteran. That's all he's gonna be. I wanna. I need to know this. I'm guessing he has like three different attack profiles or something, like styles or. Oh yeah. He just beats the fuck out of your shield as one of his styles. I reckon he's gonna have an absolutely brutal invul save, and I'd almost be willing to wager that he's gonna have a, uh, a damage cap like Abaddon. Uh, Gilliman. Does he have a damage cap? I imagine they'd fall. They'd... No, he doesn't. No, no, he doesn't, doesn't have a shield, though, I guess. So it's... Okay, hmm. here's another thing I thought was weird with there being two Loyalist Primarchs out and about. Abaddon has to fight two Loyalist Primarchs now. Yep. And <laughs> maybe he was able to take on Rubute Gilliman, but I don't think he's taking on the Lion. I mean, to be fair, he, does, he has Angron and, um, and Morty and, and Magnus kicking around, to be fair. So it, it's not... Undoable. Yeah, but they're not really fighting for any particular goal in mind. Like, Amadon's going for the throne world. He's not... He's trying to take over. But he has two Primarchs standing in his Pythos way. Morty and somewhat sort of goal-driven. So I'd imagine that would come up. Mor Mortarian's currently locked in uh, Nurgle's naughty room after uh, fudging up the Plague Wars. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, he is, isn't he? That's funny. Um, you're going to see Typhus getting fucking choke slammed by the lion at some point. At the time of recording this, which is the 24th of March, we don't actually know anything about this image that I'm showing right now. We don't know how that goes down. We don't know how Angron, uh, how the fight with Angron and the lion begins. Um, so it's going to be curious because obviously I love the lion. The lion is like one of the one of the strongest physical melee combatants out of all the Primarchs. But Angron's kind of the size of a house. Two houses, probably. Uh, mm -hmm. Two houses, probably. If you count the wingspan, three houses. Imagine if the lion was a limited release and he just gets bodied by Angron in the next uh, book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they don't even release any rules for him. God, that would, that would explain the fucking fart of a release he's gotten. <laughs> fucking no fanfare or anything. It's the wettest fart ever. Just... He's like, oh yeah, here's the lion. But he's cool. He's cool. I have to ask you guys, uh, in, in order, Red, what's your favorite helmet? The hooded helm. What's your favorite helmet, Moots? Hooded one. The hooded helm. Yeah. Or are we, are we, are we talking head options for helmets? The head options. Head options. All... Oh, okay. Then, then I'd actually say uh, helmetless. Oh, what? No, with or without the. Without. Oh, okay. And Aaron. Uh, winged helmet. Easy. Love that thing. Very heresy style, but it's sick. It's very grandiose. It looks a... like rabbit ears. I'm, I'm actually. God, I can't believe I'm going to say this. My favorite one is actually the hooded bare face. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I think everyone's actually the hooded bare face. I just the think he looks so mean. Man. He, he does look very mean. Oh, one for each. Oh, that's sick. I don't know. I, I love the hooded bare face because it's got that. It's you, you get all the anger, but it's slightly mysterious. I'd say objectively, that's probably the hardest one to paint because you've got to paint a face and then shadow it appropriately, and that's going to be hellish. Now, here's what I'm thinking by the idea of how this kit's put together. Clearly, they're not going to make us four separate head sculpts. What's probably going to happen is that the hood itself is one bit, and the face plates for the helmet and the face are separate bits. So someone's going to put the the hooded probably put the hooded helm on, and then glue his face to the <laughs> glue his face to the helmet itself. Oh no, oh, that's going to be painful. No, no, it'll be good. done the same way as the uh, I can't remember what it's called, but that. Death Guard Apothecary dude, because he has a hood and a face, and the hood's oh, kind of in two parts. That's Nauseous it. Nauseous rock bone, yeah, yeah, yeah. His, his hood is in two parts, and then his face is a third part, and you sort of put it together like that. I'm just really worried that there's going to be a, a seam on his hood that has to, you have to have two things together, and I'm really worried that I'm going to fudge that up, because uh, I don't know if I've mentioned, but my homebrew doesn't know who their Primarch is, but I've, I've sort of said in my own headcanon that it's either... 
it's either the Khan or the Lion. And so I'm going to get the Lion so I can obviously run him with, with my homebrew. And it's going to be, I'm just really worried about how, how the head's going to get put together and the rest of the body. Well, most of it will be okay, but there's so many robes. He is going to be a bastard to paint. See, what's actually going to happen is each lion box is going to be a mystery box for what head option you get. And you oh. hope to get lucky. <laughs> right, shall we uh, talk about the trailer? Yeah. Sure. yeah. So I don't know if you guys have seen... Uh, I'm not going to read it out. I'm not going to bring it up. But I don't know if you guys have seen the uh, 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 the sort of the text of all the things Gilliman says during the trailer. No, I have not, no. It's very different from the kind of stuff that we used to get for... 40k trailers where 40k trailers that have an imperial guy speaking are always somewhat hopeful and this trailer is just Gilman basically saying for lack of a better word oh my god we are fucked <laughs> yeah he says something along the lines of these truly are the grim darkness of the far future <laughs> we're, we're really in the water of 40,000 now <laughs> yeah I, 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 I really like this trailer uh all all I know is that uh, they definitely. All I know is that they definitely took uh, a lot of inspiration. Probably not, but I, I like to joke that they definitely took a lot of inspiration from uh, the Ultra Depression comic I wrote. Mm. <laughs> Only twenty, about twenty days before the trailer drops. <laughs> uh, I, I love the idea that they're just flailing at the office like oh god fucking he's on to us render this bitch quick <laughs> the ultramarine plot armor has finally worn thin <laughs> yeah <laughs> but um so we got a few teasers for a bunch of things which i'm sure we'll talk about at a later date but we got a few a few teasers in the trailer for stuff that's obviously due to come and one of them is a, a gravis apothecary who gets absolutely minced by what i believe are um so who are the ones with tails? The Tyrannies with tails and scythes. Are they like I think they're called Reavers. Oh, no, no, they're not. No, that's what the sneaky ones. Lictors. A lictor. They're the sneaky ones. Lictors. Yeah, lictors. And then, then you got the Leaper uh, character one. So yeah, we have an apothecary who presumably gets molested by lictors. Uh, personally, so obviously, I play White Scars. And having a Gravis Apothecary sounds absolutely amazing. I love the idea like, of that. Uh, I run my Salamanders with about fucking 18 aggressors, so that would be funny. Uh <laughs> oh, of course. <laughs> yeah. Of course. And if you think about it as well, Valrak was talking about it like a year ago when we got the Heavy Intercessor, this whole idea of a full Gravis army. Yeah, uh, that's my dream. <laughs> and now you, can, now you can add an Apothecary to that as well, which is just, oh, that's so know good. This is really annoying. Or what what's caused it to be within. Still, we haven't got a Gravis lieutenant yet, and it pisses me off. It fucks with me on a oh, daily it'll basis. Happen. Uh, <laughs> it'll happen in the, in the next six months. It'll happen. Uh, it, it it'll happen. It already grinds my gears. What we've also got, uh, which I'm probably I'm way too excited about because I reckon it won't be very good, but I don't care. And we're going to be getting a. Um, GW described it as a in on one of the Warhammer community pages. They called it a gunslinger redemptor. And from this picture here, we've got a Redemptor that's got the old school ranged box nort loadout with a pair of twin las cannons and uh, a missile launch. Did the version of that really not recently, but um, a little while ago? Where I think I, I think you saw it. Where he made the Redemptor into the old ironclad style thing, and it was beautiful. Oh, is, a, is it like st uh, Stibios Primaris yeah. or yeah, something yeah. like that? And it's the very old school style yeah, paint amazing. style. Seen it's, it. it's beautiful, and this is absolutely what that reminded me of. I was like, they just copied him. They just nicked it again. I'm going to put a picture of that on. Yeah. No, it's really cool. Yeah, I'm a big fan. Uh, but yeah. We've also got, uh, amongst the Flamer Primaris, we've got a Combi Flamer uh, Phobos dude. And I just want to point out, if you look at his shoulder, his right shoulder and his right arm, he's wearing Tyranid Hide. Oh. That's what it was. Oh, it should be like a... Oh. oh we're going to get like a Tyrannic War Veteran style unit for Primaris. That would be uh -huh. sick. Oh, my God. A Phobos uh, Tyranid... Uh, Tyrannic War Veteran, yeah. That'd be really cool. That Blood Angel dude did it first. That Blood Angel dude did do it first. Calf something. <laughs> right, let's scoot off the trailer. Boom. There he is, the boy. Yes. Here. Or nearest artwork Here brought to boy. life. 
by the chaos gods he's oh, approaching. No, I don't I don't think it's Oniris. I don't think it's I Oniris. I mean you look at it and it's kind of it's just kinda of irrefutable. I don't know. I think it's very obviously inspired or not like no no because no, no, Oniris said that he's working on a game. If you look at any of the uh, professional or social media profiles of people who work at GW, they can they're not under any agreement to not say they're working on the art. You can find it. Oniris almost certainly cannot say what he's working on so it will be an unreleased or even an unpreviewed game it won't be this it would have been someone else mm -hmm. yeah it's very close though I, I know which art, i know which piece of art you're talking about it's it's very close but i don't think it's him enough about sketchy artists yes enough about sketchy artists let's but look at this, this boy. Big boy so first thoughts i think he looks amazing i think we all can agree it's you know it, the whole idea of it, if it ain't broke don't fix it mm. definitely um there is one thing i do have a problem mm -hmm. with i do not like the front of the barrel of the um the assault oh, cannon. What, oh, what you don't like where the head blooms out a bit like a penis <laughs> yeah it's just not i'm just not a fan i want to say real quick that previously when i saw um a, the teaser trailer of the terminators the just the image right of the of the head that um, I said that I feel like Games Workshop was a bit late on their own game because I thought there were so many other better third-party alternatives already out there. But after oh, yeah. seeing them, I was like, "This is fantastic!" Because <laughs> I'm a fan. I'm a big fan of like Bolter, uh, Bolter Jurgens, uh, Bolter Jurgens, uh, 3D stuff. Uh, but the thing with his is that they're very barrel-chested and like just thick through the midsection which is cool and all but the way that they designed these is where the the chest flares out from the waist and it gives it kind of like that uh faux musculature musculature look yeah so something that they told us is that terminators are both firstborn and primaris so the person inside it could be either now they have brought a few primaris design elements to the terminator i just want to point out and it's very subtle uh, this, the, the yeah. waist, yeah. the belt, oh yeah, is distinctly Primaris. And if you look at just the couple inches above it, below the main chest carapace, it's very similar to the stomach, the, the, the stomach guard that Gravis mm. get. Yeah. And the power fist. But it's very Gravis, subtle. Yeah, absolutely. Oh yeah. And the power fist, of course. Yes. The power fist is, is a lot like the Gravis one, but, um... You know, ultimately, I could see why it reads as both firstborn and primaris, and I think it's I think it's fucking great. But how? Yeah. Like, are, are we going to get an option to extend their waist a little bit so they can be a primaris? Because <laughs> I think it, because it makes such a big deal about firstborn and primaris being different heights to the point where primaris can't be put into a a rhino for some reason. But I don't know. It, I suspect that that will change with tenth. I don't expect. I that hope stay. so, because I love rhinos and land raiders. I have like three. Speaking of absolutely nothing, I just want to point out that, that Storm Bolter is a also a absolute oh, it's, win. Uh, it's sexual, yeah. That's uh, such a glow up. Yeah, <laughs> sexual. <laughs> nah, but it's uh, it's glorious. It's and it still looks just like the old ones, it's, but it's just it's just so a bit much fine now. It's nice. It's very nice. I want to show you one one last picture. And this is him scaled next to the old boy, a Primaris intercessor, and obviously, obviously himself. Um, Thank God they're taller. Honestly, the only thing, honestly, the only thing I'm sad about is the, that uh, now I've uh, gone and kit bashed my <laughs> true skill <laughs> <laughs> terminators for nothing. <laughs> Yay! Woo! So I do love, I, I do love the slight changes to the helmet design. Where the sort of mouth breather bit is sort of here. brought into the helmet a bit. You can see it's a bit more inclusive with the white there. And this how the eyes and everything is just a nice bit sharper. It's a lot more defined. It's very pleasant. Definitely. Although, curiously enough, the grills... I've seen a lot of people on Reddit talk about how the grills are a nice little touch. That's not the first time that's done. If you have a look at, I believe it's the Terminator Apothecary... Uh, he has the grills on the side, and one or two others from, I believe, the Blood Angels Terminator kits have the grills on the side as well. But it, it's very cool, and it's it's it's. I mean, the eyes are a bit smaller, uh, and everything's just cleaner, and it works. But ultimately, ultimately, they haven't really strayed into uh, into into uncharted waters, and I, I, I think it's great. Mm. Yeah, absolutely love it. Love to see the return of the Mole Boys in glorious, glorious fashion.
Was it, can, can we just appreciate how smooth the trailer was for them, like just dropping down? That was like the mm-hmm. best Terminator style of uh, cinematic I think I've seen, honestly. Before they all got absolutely plastered uh, <laughs> no, there by Tyranids. There, there? there was a Terminator captain, right? Uh... Yes, there was a uh, new captain, new librarian. Um, I expect we'll get the whole shebang because Tenth is going to be centering very heavily around the Dark Angel. I expect Dark Angels Terminators of this scale to appear in the next six, twelve months. Okay, that's weird because they they did just release that Vashtor versus the Dark Angels kit with the old Deathwing Terminators, and if they update the Deathwing Terminators after that, after everyone bought them, (laughs) oh my god! I mean, I bought that kit. Oh my god! Well, I sent them all. I sent the Dark Angel stuff to Ollie, but still. Uh, just, not my problem. They're, they're not trying my to problem. Add, yeah. outsell all the stuff they already have. They're not making it anymore. It's just that way of getting rid of them. <laughs> We're onto your schemes, GW. We're onto you. Can we talk about the glow up that the uh, Hormagaunt got? Sorry, the, the Termagaunt. The Termagaunt got. They they look fucking fantastic. Yeah, well, it's it's funny because outside. In a little box of isopropyl alcohol, I have a bunch of termagants, sorry, hormagants that I need to strip. Uh, I'll still strip them. I'll still do something with them. But oh my god, the the hormagants are obviously going to get this treatment as well, because there'll be no point giving it to just the termies. Uh, that kit, I believe, someone I, I'm probably wrong. Someone's going to tell me I'm wrong, but I believe it's somewhere between 2003 and 2006. Thank you, Red. Uh, so this is a much, much, much needed sort of glow up. It's a bit of the orc so boys good, treatment, isn't it? For yeah. sure. It's it's just quality of life upgrade. Honestly, it's uh, great. The great little details. I, I love the addition of the uh, spine. Uh, no, yeah, the the spine uh, ridges and uh, uh, yeah, just overall, it's, uh, the gun looks great. The face looks uh, way less goofy. Uh, I think the idea that this biological gun has a magazine is still weird to me. <laughs> just I I imagine that the hive mind just has a sense of aesthetic. It's uh, it just knows that this is how I know the gun exactly is what supposed someone's to gonna, look like. Yeah, I know exactly what someone's <laughs> going to say. Oh, well, they evolved to match what they're attacking. They have guns, so they're going to have guns. Like, n- just make it an arm cannon. My or guy, something. we generate ammunition. <laughs> All right. We really, as a person, I'm not going to go into they detail because that's what I need to say. But I think it's the same concept, all right? Uh, and they've also revealed this a uh, Tyranid Mega Psyche. They showed it in the trailer, uh, wiping wiping the, uh, the 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 floor with the new Terminator Librarian. World of Warcraft looking. Uh, ass. I've heard some people talk about this thing and uh, say it's the that's Norn the Queen no or whatever the no fuck Norn that is. Norn Queen. Um, but whatever it is, it's very cool. He's got his little brain bug friends. Uh, I expect... I have a fun... It's kind of crazy, but I have a really silly feeling that this is going to be, like, the only Psyker in the game that's going to be in a heavy support slot, because it's huge. The Malamphope just... Or does that not, um... No, the... The other oh, you're one, right. Yeah. You're right. I'm, I'm absolutely wrong. You are. You're absolutely correct. I can't believe I forgot about that. That, that, thing, that thing's really so cool really as well. Cool. It uses its psychic stuff, and it has like a whole HP Lovecraft style tentacle effect where it explodes out. It's a really cool thing. Yeah, I'm. A, I'm a huge fan of this thing, and uh, just the fact that it absolutely demolishes the ugly ass Terminator uh, makes it an A plus in my book. It's really cool. Unfortunately, we haven't got much on him other than that at this, but yeah. Have librarians always glowed with, like, repressed sexual energy? Like, what's up with that? <laughs> Weapons, yes. Shoulder pad, that's a new one. Um... Uh, it's all that uh, suppressed uh, sexual energy from not getting laid because he's so damn ugly, obviously. <laughs> but I was hoping, um, I saw these things and it reminded me of a really cool lore bit. I think it used to have a model, but it was like the Tyranid zone throat slash neurothrope uh, like based off a thing called the Bane of Malanti, which is an old um, lore bit where this neurothrope snuck into a craft world uh, soul crystal storage, ate all of them, oh, yeah. actually to blow up the planet, separate itself from the hive mind because it gained so much intelligence and sentience, and then they caught it and they made a whole new tyranny thing out of it afterwards because it got reintegrated. And that, it's a music what it made it think of was like, is that like a Bane of Malanti thing? I'm probably wrong, but wasn't that the birth of the. the no. It was the newer folk of the zone folk. It was no one of those idea, two. Yeah, that's um, very cool. One of them's the smaller one, one's the bigger one, yes. But I, I just thought it was a cool tidbit being a big one of those. 
Rock and Stone! Rock and, Rock and Stone! Stone. <laughs> Rock and Stone, lads. <laughs> For Carl! Rock and stone to the bone. You ain't rock and stone. <laughs> you ain't coming home. Yeah. <laughs> the Hearthkin Salvagers, uh, we were talking about this before we started recording. The Hearthkin Salvagers have made me want uh, Votan mm, models love them. more than ever. And I feel, very, I feel very lucky because my girlfriend wants the Beastmen, so we <laughs> will be getting this box. As soon as it is, it's so bloody good. I, I it's, need it's really great. I, one hundred percent, this will be the kill team <laughs> I play the most. But I absolutely <laughs> adore two of them. Those being the Fist Man, looks like he'd beat you up for for a pint. Yep. I can absolutely imagine him There's being purely dusters. heavy Scottish, like. Looks like he has grav tech yeah, on his knuckle call dusters. You a, who call you a who call oh, yeah. you a fucking twat <laughs> before he knocks your lights out, and the um. <laughs> and the fucking jump pack guy is so ludicrously cool. Like the jump pack design is sick, and it, he just looks so full of malice. I love it. Curiously enough, uh, we mentioned it earlier. This jump pack, to my knowledge, this jump pack dude is the only operative in Kill Team that has a jump pack or anything like it. Now there are some operatives with the fly keyword, and obviously he will have the fly keyword. But I do wonder what other uh, unique actions the jump pack will give him. I think, Red, you mentioned earlier that it might give him some kind of special charge or something. Mm -hmm. POV, you're a dirty beast man hiding in the in bowels of an Imperial sh uh, Space Hulk. And then an elephant-sized cannonball crashes into you screaming about <laughs> ancestors. Rock and stone! <laughs> <laughs> Rock and stone goes down a hall in a blazing ball of glory. Let's not let's not sleep on let's not sleep on Johnny Grenadier over there holding just <laughs> nothing but grenades. <laughs> I, I'm just want I just want uh, there to be a special tactical ploy where the enemy is in a room in the like the space of the the Gallo Dark. Uh, Team, you open up the door and this motherfucker on the jetpacks comes screaming in his lung out, carrying the dude on the grenades. They just start carpet bombing and fly out and lock the door with you in there. You get out, guy with the machine gun just is unloading at the door right before it opens. I'm hoping he has an action, like a ranged version of like, the bomb squeak from the orc team, where he has a set amount of grenades, but at any point he can just throw all the oh, remaining yeah. grenades at once and just absolutely blow some poor bastards to kingdom come. The bomb squeak can detonate himself, and I can honestly, I can honestly see this guy detonating <laughs> himself for the good of the kid. Very selfless, you know. I'd love yeah. that. The deadliest um, operative going. Of what we were talking about was the pickaxe guy, just digging for a wall, just going, "Well, lads, for the ancestors." Pulls out his power pick and just starts going at it. I think he's. I mean, I know I haven't played Deep Rock, but I have to listen and watch you guys play it all the time. But he is definitely. The most rock and stone <laughs> of all of them. Actually, actually, sorry, scratch that. This dude with mm. the pickaxe and this dude with the, the triple barrel machine gun, the pair of them are straight I, from deep I, rock. I'm really yeah. hoping the, uh, <laughs> the high last guy there has some sort of like beam alternative as a weapon because that would be funny in Kill Team, just going through four different dudes at once. Uh, I'm really wondering exactly. I really want to know what the nu the guy with the knuckles is going to be capable of if he's See, going to be I'm, really I'd imagine strong. I imagine another weapon as well because the fighters normally do in kill teams, so it may be quite a silly thing. Because I just want to walk him up to someone's chaos, a champion. It's just this dude, half his height, just punches just him in the dick. Like the uh, the Scotsman from Samurai Jack, rooting, tooting, fucking sword wielding, <laughs> elf loving, <laughs> son of a bitch. <laughs> I just go lock to across the jaw. <laughs> right, let's take a, a last quick look uh, before we move on to our yeah, main segment cool. of these My dudes. My favourite is easily the sorcerer yeah. with his servo skull, eight pointed staff, and the very Zintrian style second head uh, mutation going on. I think he's very cool. Yes. Well, they are they're chaos affiliated. I'm I'm putting it down right now. This fella. Is gonna have the, the fellow with the gas mask is gonna have some oh, kind of yeah, contagion sure, ability, sure. like all the other Nurgle things do. That dude over at the left has three arms. Oh, he, he does, does. have three arms. It, look, it looks like a very Zinch style, so, not Zinch, Snashy knife. Yeah. You know what that means, boys. Three times the hugs. 
And we can tell which one's the, the Cornet one, the one that's even more buff than all the other ones. It's just blind, li literally blind rage. You, you, you can't see. You can't see nothing in that mask. That's why he's enraged. But <laughs> it's, it's, it's quite funny because... I was talking to I was talking to my girlfriend about him, and she said that he is an awful lot like reminded her an awful lot like the uh, Berserker from Gears of War, just blind, oh, yeah. but extremely muscular and extremely deadly. The kind of he's got a, I mean they've all got ram heads, but you know think about him singularly. He's got a ram head. He's blind. He's going to charge at you just willy nilly in one direction and fucking eat you as soon as he can touch you. Fun fact about the Gears of War Berserkers: they're all female. Uh, sp sp speaking about the like uh, re um, individual affiliations, uh, I mean, it's actually funny that you mention it if you go back, because we have the Nurgle one, kind of, with gas mask, we have the uh, Korn one, the Zinch one with the staff, and I suppose then the Slanesh one with the free swords, mm. uh, and, and, and then we have the Iron Warrior. <laughs> 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 that dude has augmentics. Right. But we also have a whole extra page of them. Uh, these ones, I think, are a little bit more generic, but this guy here... Yeah. Man's got a whip. <laughs> that's a whip. I don't know what that's going to translate to. Hopefully it's not. Hopefully he's not Slanesh affiliated, because that makes it even scarier. This man's got an absolutely <laughs> the huge man's got a mallet. beehive on a stick. This man dude's a got gong. a shield, so he'll have some sort of fun <laughs> in bond save. Is it a gong? <laughs> There's chaos gong. That's a gong. <laughs> hey, hit him with the slow jazz. Yeah, look at him. He's not holding it like a shield. They're just like Johnny. Start gonging him and just him screaming as he hits on it haphazardly. I think we can safely say that this guy in the center is probably the leader of the group. Uh, although I wish I wish the sorcerer was, but the sorcerer won't be. Um, but this is a funny little thing that this is the second chaos um, faction that has a bunch of dudes accompanied with a sorcerer, and I don't think. Uh, no, it's the uh, well. You, if you count the warp coven as well, that's the third. And no, I don't think many many other factions have that. They're either all psychers like the Grey Knights, or they just get none. And the Chaos really do have the monopoly on kill teams with with uh, psycher powers at the moment. Right, gentlemen, should we move on to the main bit? For sure. The weird and obscure law uh, that we wanted to talk about. Hell yeah! I thought it'd be cool to start off with the biggest red bastard going around. That being the the very glorious uh, Abominatus. He is basically a like second edition style law Imperator Titan that basically got um, possessed by a greater demon of corn or a bloodthirster sort of thing. And it's quite quite a funny situation because it just grew to a silly size. It was originally from a uh, legion called the Legio Magna which is a Chaos Knight household that first turned traitor of Horus way back during like, the Siege of Terror. They were like one of the first traitor legions. But um, Abominatus... One of the first traitor Titan legions. Yes, they were like had really good connections with the Sons of Horus, Lunar Wolves back in the day sort of thing. And they immediately just went, right, we're following that guy as soon as he turned traitor, basically. So they were there for the whole heresy run of the mill, more or less. It sounds like they were replaced by Legio Mortis. Oh, yeah, yeah, maybe. Because Legio Mortis was in the first couple of books in the Heresy series. They were the Le Titan Legion attached to the Luna Wolves. You had the Dies Irae. That was, that was their Imperator. Oh, that's quite cool, actually. Yeah, because uh, there is mention of them, obviously, at the Siege of Terror and doing some other he like Heresy bits, and they sort of fade out of resistance after a while. But yeah, they make a lot of sense. They sort of revamped the lore with a different name. Mm. Now, Abominatus is from the Legio, so he, obviously um, they've got a very cool colour scheme. It's very like sort of umber orange, sort of fades, and has some really gnarly um, heraldry, like the sort of flaming skull and all this very, very cool, very obviously chaos style stuff going on. So it was kind of like from the start they were going, like they were designed to be there. But some of the weapons Abominatus has, if you've seen an image of him, is, uh, is fucking hilarious. Like, um, one of the things he has is a thing called a blood cannon, which is basically a giant, like, hot pot of, like, magma heated up blood that sprays out. It's like, uh, like those, like those lizards that shoot from under the eyes. This guy just has one, there's one of these things the size of a house on top of him. 
and he just projects this god awful mix at people. Um, and he's like one of the only things that has it, other than like another old second edition model. I kind of like the fact, though, that, that Abominatus doesn't actually have more, any more than like one a reliable piece of art. Because it kind of ma- and that one piece of art is so old. It's like okay, this is this is a, it's like a caveman depiction, you know. So when when no, I think it's great because when you imagine Abominatus, you've got that added horror of him being totally unknown or unknowable. You just know that it's you just know that it's an Imperator that's completely possessed by a bloodthirster, and that is, and that is that, that itself. You don't need to know anything about him. Just that itself is really spooky. What else does he have? Just a bad time. No, so he, really interestingly enough, he has um, he has a weapon only ever found on the Brass Scorpion, and it's basically a um, it's just called a Scorpion Cannon, and it's just this big full-on like rotary turret thing, and it's just really weird that he's the only other thing that's recorded to have that other than the Brass Scorpion, like it's nothing crazy, but it's just really bizarre. As a very unique thing for him to have specifically. See, that's really funny because the thing that makes the the scorpion cannon special is the sort of the fact that you can fire it in any direction because it's it's essentially just a gun mounted on the end of a tail, a, a mechanical tail, and that that sort of fits in with the vibe from the sort of the the one picture you can you can see of of Abominatus as well. He actually looks like an orc gargant. Mm. He's just got stuff going on in every direction. He does a little bit. It really does look like an orc construction. It's uh, the fucking the crab legs are <laughs> probably like the, the most uh, obvious piece of chaos uh, influence, I suppose. Yeah, he has like chain whips. They have a name that they're called manglers. And they're described as gigantic chain claws. The Mangler. Which I think is just kind of great. Because that's just so hilariously corn. You know what this sounds like? This sounds like before they decide to make the Castigator Titan. The Castigator Titan was the the father of all Titans. The, one of the first controlled by an AI. And it was also possessed by a bloodthirster. I it might not be a bloodthirster, but it was it, it it was very much the same vibe as Abominatus. It was huge and possessed and full of attitude. I don't know where this comes from. I don't know if this is sourced anywhere, but I'm going to put it in here so you can see it. But essentially, this is a, I don't and again I'm, I I don't know if this is gospel. This may be complete twaddle. <laughs> Holy shit! This could be complete bollocks. I have no idea if it's real or not. But this is allegedly God the sort of size damn. we're looking at for Abominatus. So he's huge. You look at the image above him, and look at that Titan to his bottom right. That's looking that's looking pretty accurate, if you ask me. Ah, that thing is knee height, like pretty one for one, like not even a joke. That's that's pretty spot on. That's really spooky. Do you know what's what's what I do find uh what I do find interesting though is that isn't isn't Abominatus he's technically still out there. Like there's nothing to say he's dead, right? Oh yeah, no. There's a very, very funny quote I, fa- I found on the wiki. I'm not sure what it's from specifically. But uh, the official quote is it is highly unlikely such a vile creation would die quietly or go unheralded by its bloody handed cornate kin. So he's he's around. He is, he is somewhere. Some poor planet is just going to hear X want to give it to you, come from orbit one day, as he just comes flying in, or just warps in, and it's like, oh no. <laughs> I think Abominatus is a hilariously cool concept, because there's no real other good example of like proper demon possession on a huge model scale, like this guy. Like, there's the Primarchs and stuff like that, but, like, obviously they're not getting possessed to a degree, unless you count that one Fulgrim bit, but we don't talk about that. Um, but then you've got this guy, and it's like, that's so absurdly cool and out there. It's a shame they haven't done more with it since. It's it's crab time, Imperial scum. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just think it's lovely to see that even in the distant grimdark future of the 41st millennium, everything, even Titans, still evolve into crabs. Right, shall we move on to uh, moots? Absolutely, and boy, 
am I excited to talk about this one? <laughs> from the original <laughs> Rogue Trader rulebook from 1987. This was before I was born. Comes Obi-Wan Sherlock Clouseau, the first ever named Inquisitor. Armed with a trench coat and the mother of all neckbeards, this potent psyker hunts down the mutants and the heretics with his trusty retinue. Surgeon, if I can't pronounce that word, Surgeon Watson, an expert physician who has dedicated his life to protecting Obi-Wan. Arbitrator Dreyfus, quote from the books, Dreyfus serves Obi-Wan out of a sense of duty, but has no real love for the Inquisitor Lord. And finally, we have Inquisitor Anakin. A brash and impulsive inquisitor with an incredibly powerful psychic potential. However, his inability to control his anger often gets him into trouble, aptly armed with a force weapon as well. I. Ugh, everything about this. I just love it. It's. Uh, I mean, he's one of the most badass inquisitors to ever exist. Besides being a powerful psyker, he also rocks Jokero digital weapons that are built into his fingers. Guys, he literally has finger guns. <laughs> oh, the digi weapons. <laughs> and, yeah, oh my god, those things are cool. Yeah, right? Fucking, I, I mean, it's, it's, I'm sure there are other uh, Inquisitors who also rock these, but I mean, one of them is a damp flamer. I, I just love the idea of him just pointing his finger at someone and going fucking roasting time, and uh, <laughs> 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 suddenly you're just a pile of ash. It's, oh god. And that's not all, though. This man is so bad to the bone that he refuses... Th this is from the book. He refuses to wear a helmet, instead of wearing a plus-size fedora. And... <laughs> I, it's, God, I, I, I imagine you're bringing up a picture of him right now, just to just really sell the picture of this man. And... Uh. This sounds like someone's first time writing a character like a high school student <laughs> like first time writing a creative story uh, yeah <laughs> that's it's, it's it's so great though the complete and total lack of originality is left me hollow To, to further sell this on, on both aspects of the, these uh, two uh, points you bring up, he is armed with not only a bolt pistol, but also a four sword, a chain sword, uh, two of each grenade. That's how they stated in the rules. E two of each. <laughs> uh, uh, and if you thought that was the end of it, he's armed with even more biomechanical enhancements such as nose filters obviously yes obviously what? so he can smell the pretty <laughs> flowers better uh photochromatic eye drops for whatever that's good for an immune injector infravision contacts and stimulant chemicals in case he didn't feel powerful enough already and this is glossing over a bunch of other things in his uh, that he put, which is in his possession. I, I could not write down everything because I mean then we'd be here for a while. Uh, and 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 this is, as the lore text says, he needs all of these things. He must have them to be ready for just about anything. After all, he is an inquisitor, and <laughs> fucking boy, what an inquisitor he is. Uh, I I think it's safe. I think it's safe to say that this man needs to be brought back into the canon. He has it all, honestly. Nothing. I mean, nothing lore breaking. I think at least. Uh, amazing fashion sense. Um, absolutely amazing fashion sense. Probably a powerful jawline hidden under that godly beard of his. Uh, I mean, obviously, the only argument I can think of is that he's just too damn powerful. I mean, Abaddon would just have to run back into the Eye of Terror. Uh, as, as soon as fucking Obi Wan Sherlock Clouseau showed up, I was... yeah, definitely nothing lore breaking. But George Lucas would like to have a lore. <laughs> <laughs> yep, <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. 
Abaddon, Abaddon would flee from the man who can smell fear and can't see <laughs> colours. Yes. Yes. Sorry, so let me get this straight. His retinue his retinue consists of uh, a medic based on uh, was it Dreyfus? Uh, a what, was, what did you say? A, uh, so, so it was the medic who was Watson. Then we have then, uh, then we have Arbitrator Dreyfus and then he has his own sub inquisitor who's Anakin. So he has. So Anakin is is kind of an interrogator. I and, suppose. Yes. Oh my goodness. No, apparently it states that Anakin is also an inquisitor. Yeah. Oh really? Right? Yes. With his own retinue. But he's not quite. But okay. He, he he's he's not as good. He's not a Lord Inquisitor, I suppose. He's. So it's almost like. Um, He's a it's teacher who like teaches teachers. A, uh, he's on the council, but he's not corrupt. He's <laughs> the rank of Lord Inquisitor. Oh, <laughs> 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 uh, God. Even in the 41st millennium, Anakin won't <laughs> ever get the title. Can't catch a break, that guy. But, nope. uh, no. Oh, man. That's really fucking cool. I like that. I think my favorite thing about about this particular... I'm not going to try and say his name because I'll put him in the wrong order. But I think my favorite thing about this Inquisitor is that he is so perfect. Uh, he's so perfectly an example of, of GW saying, hey, we know your homebrew is wacky. We support you. Yeah. We know that your OC Inquisitor, we know that your OC, you know, insert whatever, we know it's really silly. Don't let anyone gatekeep you because you're just here to have fun. And I love that about him because he's the... He is so clearly the embodiment of that. For sure. For sure. It's, uh... Honestly, <laughs> GW, if, if you're listening, this is the kind of shit we want. F fuck the Primarchs. Fuck the return of the Primarchs. I, I, I say bring the return of Obi-Wan Sherlock Clouseau. <laughs> there, 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 there we I go. Would, I would read there about we have it. I would, I would read about Obi-Wan Sherlock Clouseau. He sounds like a fun guy. Should we move on to uh, my segment? What I wanted to talk about was... Um, what I wanted to talk about was a wonderful little segment that I thought had... A wonderful little segment from Fulgrim, the Palantine Phoenix. It personally drew me in quite a lot, uh, and I just wanted to, to, to sort of go over it. So, essentially, um, I'm going to read out a... a uh, extract from the Palantine Phoenix, where Fulgrim is talking to Iterator Golconda Pike, who I don't know a lot about, but I think I did read briefly that she's somehow, she somehow serves Malkador. Uh, I know someone's going to correct me on this, but uh, we'll just run with that for the time being. <clears throat> so this Iterator Golconda Pike isn't a, isn't an idiot. She's, she, she's obviously capable of talking with a Primarch and, and, and whatnot. So, to sort of quote the passage, Fulgrim sat back. I was betrothed once, he continued idly. Several times, actually. Political marriages, of course, made to seal binding agreements or open negotiation with certain executive dynasties. Pike didn't reply. His tone had become somber. A rare thing for Fulgrim. The Phoenicians seemed to always be smiling, laughing at some joke only he understood. But now he seemed tired. He rubbed his face. I outlived them all, one way or another. Did you love them? Fulgrim smiled slowly. Some, I think, at first. After a time, I stopped. Love was a weakness I could ill afford in those days. A billion lives rested on my shoulders, and any hesitation on my part would have doomed them all irrevocably. He laughed softly. Or so I told myself then. And now? Now I know it would have. There is no room for weakness in this galaxy. No room for imperfection. I love this little extract because not only does it does it sort of not only did it when I found out about this did it tell me something I, I didn't know and that's that Fulgrim had actually been married and wed long before the uh, the emperor had found him. Uh, but that Fulgrim, at the very least, a Primarch, could feel not just platonic but romantic love. You know. Uh, it also 
in a way, gentlemen, uh, to a degree, validates our last episode. Because if they were political marriages, it's highly likely that, at least to begin with, Fulgrim would have been expected to produce an heir. So it, it almost indirectly confirms that at least one of the Primarchs has indeed had sexual intercourse. And not only that, but it was also with, presumably, a normal woman from Chemos. And so it also confirms that Primarch penis isn't too big for a normal person to handle. But it all also certainly confirms, I don't know if this was confirmed at some other point, but if it wasn't, then it certainly confirms it now that Fulgrim and likely the rest of the Primarchs are almost certainly uh, sterile. Completely sterile. I expect that's true. Uh, seeing as uh, with the whole, like, how Space Marines are sterile as well and shit. But yeah, no, I really I really like that passage as well. Um, not only because of the reasons you said, but because it just paints Fulgrim in a very um, tragic picture in that uh, in that brief, uh, very brief passage. And I love it. It could be that he was the only Primarch, or one of the only Primarchs, to properly experience sexual pleasure, mm. which would make his fall to Slanesh uh, in, in my mind, at least, even more poignant and understandable, um, because he he t- obviously before his strive for per- perfection, it was it was striving for sort of artistic value and the finer things in life and a degree of elegance and presumably happiness, and and he must have found those things. I mean, he can't not have found those things in in uh, you know sexual intercourse. So it does make his fall to Slanesh to be all that more stark. But also, curiously, as a little side note I've got, it, it technically puts him on keno- on Chemos for at least a generation. I don't know if this, how much this means, but the average lifespan on Chemos, uh, according to Fulgrim in the same book, I believe, was the age of 30. Um, so it means he must have been on Chemos for at least that long before the Emperor found him. Fucking citizens of Chemos were putting the Necrons to shame. Goddamn. Goddamn. Damn, he had to be on <laughs> Chemos for more than 30 years. I mean, we do have examples of non-romantic uh, relationships from Primarchs, but I mean, if anything, that just kind of further proves the point that the the the, cap- the capacity for love is there in all of the Primarchs, um, or some some more than others. I mean, no, yeah, it's a very interesting little segment actually, because obviously, no no other Primarchs are sort of described that sort of like relationship style nature. Like, there's a couple other weird ones that float around, but there's nothing, like, that specific. And it's very, obviously, in tune for him. But then he seems very, sort of, tragic about it, so he's actually feeling sadness about that as well. Which is, obviously, something else that Primarchs aren't crazy known for being about. But it's it's curious, though, actually, because when you think about Fulgrim as sort of a, um, a point of reference to the other Primarchs, we can, you know, we could, maybe not safely, but we could assume that the other Primarchs or at least some of them would, would feel these as well. And it does it does paint, you know, Primarchs, certain Primarchs fall to, to chaos. Let's look at, let's look at Perturabo and Dawn, man. Those two, oi. oi. Uh, even more favourably as well, like Perturabo, mm. you know? Uh, you know, they can feel love, and they can almost certainly feel rejection. Uh, uh, well, we, I guess we knew that one, I suppose. Uh, but they can feel everything we can feel. It's just, you know, how do they deal with it? And it's very clear that the Primarch's sort of hyper-intelligence is really one of the only things that actually sets them apart from, from normal people. You know, the Emperor is compared to being this, this sort of non-human thing all the time, but the Primarchs do tend to embody the, the, the reality of humanity a lot. Hey, Perturabo liked his sister at least, until he broke her neck. Mm. Literally goes, I'm built different, and breaks her neck. Sometimes you just gotta break your sister's neck. Yeah. Don't know how to say it otherwise. And and the fact that they, uh, uh, as like different from, to differentiate them from the emperor is that they actually do have a yeah. humanity, uh, which is partially what makes them so interesting because they are, they are demigods, but they're still humans. It's a, uh, it's a tragedy of the kind yeah. of Greek god. Kind of mythology that uh, really actually makes them interesting. 
Yeah, actually, um, I was just thinking Vulcan is a great example for sort of general love, but not in a in a sort of sexual sense, but just in a like love for humanity, love for fellow person sort of sense. And he passes that obviously onto his whole legion. So it's just an example of what they sort of could be compared to the sort of heartless yeah. sociopath they're normally sort of uh, described as. So it's quite um, it's quite cool seeing the sort of difference from one to the other in a similar capacity, just in different specifications. Yeah. Right, shall we move on to our final segment uh, of the episode? Uh, Red? Yes, sir. So, to balance out all this filthy human talk, I have something different, vastly different, than all, what all y'all brought to the board. Do you guys, you guys know what pariahs are, yeah? What, what, are, the, what are the pariahs? So the pariahs are, well, rather or not, the pariah gene is a human defect that occurs like one, like one in every million souls ends up becoming a pariah. And what they are is they're kind of like a psychic blank to where they're, they're like a black hole in the warp to the point where it seems they, they don't really have a soul. It's more like it's, it's a nega soul. It's. It repels the warp. Um, psychers around them are usually at best uncomfortable, at worst in physical agony. Like the Sisters of Science for the 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 the, the small little faction that's attached to the studies all the time. They're all uh, they're all called psychic blanks, but they they all have the pariah gene. And uh, as a representation for what they do is like when the Sisters of Science, well, when Magnus attacked Gilman on his way to Terra. And the Sisters of Silence attacked him. They caused Magnus a great deal of pain, even in his ascended demonhood form. But what I want to talk about is something called a Necron Praia, which has some interesting lore uh, suggestions. In the game Dawn of War, most prevalently from what I remember, there's a unit called the Necron Praia. And they used to be a tabletop unit. And what they are is that they are human humans that have the Praia gene, that the Necrons took and threw in the biotransference uh, bio uh, furnace, turning them into pseudo-Necrons. Oh. They still have organic bits underneath, but it's very limited, but they are outwardly Necrons. And what they, and it is suggested way back in like a, like a third or fourth edition battle report, I guess, is that the Pariah gene was actually... Uh, cultured by the Necrons on uh, Primordial Earth or Terra for them to develop uh, an anti-warp weapon. And would... Yeah, so the, the, the idea is that thousands upon millions of years ago before humans became, you know, what they were today, even on, on our time, uh, the Necrons came by and messed with the human genome to give them the pariah gene to try and see if they can create these anti-warp weapons, right? And so this got me thinking, it got a few other people thinking I saw around places like Reddit and such, is that there is some type of connection between humanity and the Necrons. One of which is some of the most obvious on how like the Necrons are very humanoid in their appearance in terms of their skeletal, uh, their skeletal structure. Hmm. Uh, because that's what Necrons are, right? They're just the skeletons of what they once were. And people comment on the how similar in physiology and just in appearance they are to the humans. And in the books, especially in uh, Twice Dead King, in the first book, Twice Dead King Ruin, Ultix, the main character, sees how the Imperium is on a crusade through his galaxy he's in, and he notes on how similar humanity is to old Necron Tyr, being a very violent and warlike species that goes around not as like a, a strategic fleet, but they're just a hammer that just smashes worlds down to colonize them, basically, which I thought was also interesting. And what, what gets me thinking is that in lore, the Void Dragon, the thing that's trapped under, underneath Mars, is a shard of, uh, is an ascendant shard of the Catan, also known as the Void Dragon. It is called the God of Machines. And back in the days of like the, uh, back when the Necrons attacked their gods to break them into Pokemon, uh, this ascended shard of the Void Dragon fled to the solar system to uh, gain strength there, which was 
uh, weird when you think about that there's humans there. And so, uh, hold on. So the idea being that instead of the Necrons just culturing the Pryogene inside the humanity, what the theory was that it was Necrons who made humanity based Whoa, off of old Necron tier DNA. I'm uh, I'm officially putting on the tinfoil hat and uh, joining you in this. Uh... Because the similarities between huma humans being very uh, similar to old Necron tier, being very violent and warlike, uh, just the physical appearance alone, uh, the fact that a Necron architecture such as pyramids and their obelisks are very similar to old ancient humans, such as our pyramids and our uh, ruins, such as the Aztec and the Mayans and the uh, Indonesians, even to an extent. They just have a very similar uh, theme going on with them. So what I was thinking is that the Void Dragon must have known about humanity there because he has this plan, right? To go there and wait for humanity to evolve into a viable source of food for him, huh. basically, and then do the biotransference uh, on all of them and make a new horde of Necrons and feasting on their souls at the same time. But I like to think about it in the way that the Necrons saw the old ones seeding life and were just like, you know what, we want, because they're super petty, right? Uh, they're like, well, we can do it too. And so what they did is probably is that they made humanity or tried to make humanity based off of their own, uh, based off their own DNA as kind of like a screw you old ones, we can make life too. And I think it's really interesting. It kind of gives a, a very primordial connection between humanity and the Necrons. I kind of like that, because the Necrons are touted as being the oldest characters in the setting, uh, and that humanity is barely is barely, barely even infantile in comparison, uh, and yet at the same time we've got the Emperor, who is this, this, this all-powerful bastard, and if we, if we sort of take heed of this theory, this tinfoil hat theory, <laughs> you, you could find some connection or reasoning there to sort of allocate the that sort of ancient heritage of the necrons with this sort of eldritch power of the emperor you know that sort of evolutionary chain uh oh that's so crazy i'm gonna have really, i'm gonna have a lot of trouble getting this out of my head sort of going going forwards now yeah it's so cool right That, that that's where it all starts at to be honest there's not a lot uh of uh, lore on any of that stuff there's one battle report of necron pariahs uh they were they're they're said to be retconned out of it but um and their models are discontinued yeah and um so they discontinued their models a while ago with these uh, old necron pariahs but um like it, it adds such a such a cool flavor to the whole idea behind them. Yeah. There's actually, I actually have a quote here in, uh, from one of the only named Necron uh, Pariah characters from the Dawn of War game. And uh, his name was Tomas uh, Mac uh, Maccabee. And it actually gives you a lot of insight that they're not just brain dead, like all most Necron warriors, because he has this to say. Existentialism is possibly the most onerous imp imposition of life. The need to ask why, to find some explanation, nevertheless, despite the perfections granted to me, I remain a living man and so must suffer under the cacophony of questions in my brain. And so I send out this final message to attempt to answer some questions you will have. Why did I lead my fellows to their doom here on this plateau? Why have I submitted myself to the power of immortal creatures who have risen from the sands? How could I, a respected scientist and prominent citizen, turn my back on civilization that has given me so much? The answer is simple. I have done everything in the name of purity. Before my memories and emotions were reassembled in this more perfect form, some 15 cycles ago I have spent a human lifetime studying civilization in all its forms. The sum of my work can be put thus. All life exists in discord. War and strife affect all known societies, and all species spend their existences com competing with others for limited resources. From the cries of an infant 
for the maternal uh, teat of the wretched stench of the age dying in their in their own filth life is a series of squabbles and ugly messes there is an alternative there exists a state in which all conflict is resolved and all is cold and silent there are no wants no wars no squabbles you may call this state death if you wish but that is a misnomer death is but the ending of life and that is only a means to an end the end is purity in the time when all is still and unchanging our universe began its purity and it will return to that blessed state hastening that return is great work of the perf of the perfected beings i have awoken and who have made me their own you have tried to undo their great work you have spent your vile unclean selves across the galaxy making a mockery of beautiful silence we have wrought it was all in vain rejoice we have returned your days are at an end which I think is super cool because it shows that regard even though he's been necronified, he still retains personality, which shows there's some um there's some um cohesion between human biology and necron biotransference. Which gives me the idea that ne humans are meant to become necrons. I thought that was about to divulge into a sort of poxwalker style scenario where they're in the sort of thing after being transformed. And they're still fully aware of what's happening with no control of themselves. But no, that's that's interesting. That's different as well. No, yeah, it, it just gives it just lends to the idea that um, if anything, the Necrons made humanity to to increase their number of Necrons, right? Learning how to farm biologicals. Because there's a finite amount of Necrons, even though they're like billions and trillions, they're still just a set number, and they keep losing them in battles. I like that a lot. And I tell you what, even if this whole theory is completely whack, um, there is one thing I would like to come of it, and that is, you know, some some more more Games Workshop pariah models. See, yeah. it's, it's really sad. It's really sad. A while ago, there was a... Um, it was doing the Psychic Awakening. Ne Necron was called Pariah. And everyone was like, oh, we're going to get new pariah models. We're going to get some old boys back. No, nothing. It was just some flayed ones, that, uh, like £37.50 for five models. For 50, 50 points of the stuff, so it's like, no, that's, that's not what we wanted, GW. It's, it's not what we wanted. So it was a big letdown, um, because it was the perfect opportunity to have exactly that. Yeah, in-game, they're like a... Yeah, in like the Dawn of War game, there's supposed to be a heavy-hitting melee unit, and when me and Tom played uh, played Salamanders against my Necrons, I broke his Salamander line with them. <laughs> then I stole his Dreadnought. Oh, it was that game? Oh my god! I see. I know we haven't got much time left, but I have to talk. I have to talk about that. I made a, a, a named dreadnought veteran in Dawn of War, uh, being completely unaware of the kind of bullshit that Necrons could do. I sent him in to 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 push to push his Necrons back, and I come back to my side of the board to fiddle. I'm not a pro gamer. I don't play a lot of Dawn of War. I, I move my camera back to my side of the board to just do some stuff. And by the time I could move back to the other side of the board, for some reason, my venerable Dreadnought is now fighting my own salamanders <laughs> with a this whole cadre of Necrons just behind him. Get, get croned, idiot. It's just like, what the, f what the fuck? <laughs> Welcome to the Immortal Just Empire, Ash machine brother. <laughs> Just the Necron climbed up there, ripped open the sarcophagus, and went, time to go yeah, manual, it, it... and like ripped out Ash Mantles, just nugget corpse, tops him to the side, and hops in, and just starts <laughs> like, piling it himself. <laughs> Anyways, so, thank you very much for tuning into our second episode of the Astartes Anonymous podcast. Uh, we cannot wait to continue this podcast and create more shorts and reels on our YouTube channel. Uh, please feel free to have a look at our Discord, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok, all in the description below. And yeah, thank you all very much.